Yeah, but I'll be here. Okay. okay. Do we just let everyone file into into the room? Just wait for that number to bottom out, and then we'll get started. Great stuff. Okay. There is always this awkward moment where we're sort of blinking and staring at the screen. <laughs> um, yes. Okay. Right. Well, I think that's most people in the room. I think we've got a lot to get through today, so we'll get started. Um, good morning, or oh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, and welcome to the latest in the Sierra Research Trust's lecture series. Um, when we think of carbon monoxide exposure, generally we listen to the official voice describing its situation and its effects. This could be the healthcare professional, the gas engineer, the emergency responder. But what's often missed is the person that's actually experienced the exposure. It sometimes gets forgotten that behind every incident there's a human story. Often it's not that people don't have voices or opinions or feelings, but they're not actually heard. Listening benefits these groups by identifying what they need in terms of prevention, awareness, rectifying any situation where CO may be a risk. So I'm really, really pleased that we have been joined by one of our favourite researchers, Dr. Judy Connolly from Liverpool John Moores University. Judy's going to be telling us about the important work that she does in this area. Judy's background is as a nurse, and she teaches on the nursing and social work courses at the university. She uses interpretive phenomenological analysis, IPA, which is a qualitative research technique which amplifies the voice of those who experience carbon monoxide exposure. And she's going to hear today to tell us about the work here. Um, and given the time, I'm not going to take much longer. Um, but just to say, as we progress through, if you could put any questions you have in the chat or the Q&A, and there will be about four or five break points during the hour where we'll stop um, and we can address those questions. Um, I think Julie's got some quizzes and some polls and things too, but I'll let that let her explain that to you. So without any further ado, I'd like to hand over to Dr. Julie Connolly. Thanks, Julie. Thank you, Adrian. Um, hello, everybody. And um, thank you very much to the um, Carbon Monoxide Research Trust for inviting me to talk to you today. As Adrian says, I have got a couple of things for you to do. Um, but I just I just like, like to make a start. This is quite a complex area. You know, I found I started with one thing, as, as often we do in research, and it's grown into quite a few other things. And much of my general work has kind of converged to make this this these ideas in this whole so um so I'm as Adrian said Julie Connolly I'm going to mention these other people um, as we go through um Jen Germain can't be here today but she's somebody who works with me very closely here at the university and then we'll take it from there so um as I say lot to get through so we've got low levels of CO, then we've got this idea of underserved communities and poverty and exclusion and how these two things are connected. And then about my research, about how it's done, about why it's important. And these won't take too long, these, these other sections. These are just sort of maybe some ideas about how we as people who are interested in helping people in these situations um, to tackle what's ahead and, um, you know, sort of a timeline. And there's some projects going on and we've got some ideas for some future projects as well. And then a summary. So and but that's what I want you to think about at the moment. As Adrian said, it's not that people don't have a voice. It's that there's nobody listening sometimes or it's very difficult for them to be heard for a variety of reasons. But first, we're going to talk a little bit about the this low levels of CO idea. So um, this is discussion about some of my previous research with people who've been exposed and their voices and um, just about low level exposure, because it seems to be something that's not, you know, it's not given so much attention. Um, I've quite often talked about a, a pyramid of exposure. That's something that's in the literature. So we know most and most of the resources 
are driven towards people who experience acute high doses of, you know, they're in immediate danger of losing their lives. So that's what we know most about. And then as it widens, there's probably more people who suffer with chronic lower levels of exposure. So they're not well, they have vague symptoms. It might not be the classic headache, nausea, vomiting, dizziness, unconsciousness, unconsciousness, and then, you know, and then death. Um, but they still have these debilitating, you know, fatigue problems, not well. It's been described as like having flu without having a, a fever or a raised temperature, um, you know, just generally unwell. And in our lives, we have stresses, we have other illnesses. It's very common to have a chronic condition, um, you know, and people tend to assign these things to, I'm just a bit busy at the moment, I'm just a bit tired at the moment, it's the time of year, and so on and so forth. So that's chronic. And then underneath the chronic, at the base of the pyramid, is what they call occult, which just means hidden. So there could be lots of people who are having um, exposure to lower levels of carbon monoxide, and they might not ever even know it. So that's something that that you know sort of we need to to take into account. And the other thing is just maybe a little chat about carbon monoxide itself and how it affects people. So we know that it it joins with um, hemoglobin to form carboxyhemoglobin, so you can't oxygenate properly. Um, it also combines with other um, other uh, things like your muscle um, fibers. So that's you know your heart and and you sort of what controls your your bowel and bladder and and things like that it also attacks your white matter of your brain so it's it's absolutely you know it's it's absolutely sort of you know very very serious small amounts can be fatal but people seem to be just suffering with these lower levels that, that you wouldn't set your alarm off if you've got an alarm um you know and it just sort of continues on and they can't get help and because there's nothing there's nothing to look for there's nothing to see so all of these things we're going to discuss as we go through. Um, you also are, have a, a small amount of carbon monoxide anyway, it's essential for cell functions. Um, if you're a smoker, you have a, a larger amount, still tiny, but a larger amount, but it doesn't seem to impact you. If, you, if you're not a smoker, then, you know, it, it would, you, you know, when you had that low level dose, then that would, you would have some, some feelings from that, you wouldn't feel well. But if you're a smoker, then you just seem to sort of be able to, to carry on with those with those levels of carbon monoxide. So, yeah, and it's um, it's it could be that that poor people do suffer more from this. And we'll, we'll talk a bit more about that as we go through. But anything that causes incomplete combustion of carbon based fuels could lead to exposure to carbon monoxide. OK, so these are the summary of my findings from my PhD on the right hand side of this screen. And these are the summary of issues that kind of led me to this lived experience sort of research. So as Adrian said, uh, my background's in nursing. And so I've got no excuses, really. But I thought that CO exposure had to be significant to be serious. I didn't think there was such a thing as lower level exposure. Um, and I did think that if you were exposed to, to carbon monoxide, but then you were rescued and then you survived, that you'd be fine. And that's not the case at all. So people, whether in my research, whether they had an acute exposure or a chronic exposure, they, um, they absolutely had um, problems afterwards and these were physical problems you know there was one person who um, when I was talking about heart cardiac muscle before um, you know that person that sustained some damage to their heart and because there was a time when um, that person was presenting to healthcare um, but they didn't know about the carbon monoxide that person was asked constantly if they were a cocaine user because that was the only explanation for them having um, having sort of that cardiac damage. They didn't have any other risk factors. And of course, plenty of people, that person wasn't, but plenty of people are cocaine users, you know? So um, yeah, so I thought that if you were rescued and survived, you'd be fine, but you're not. And it's not just physical things, it's mental and emotional things as well. So I had one participant who, um, just had very, very complicated grief, just found it very, very difficult to get over the loss of somebody close to them. And 
in their reactions, they were they didn't recognise who they were in terms of how they spoke to other people. This was something that went through solicitors and there was a compensation case and because somebody had been negligent, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And they found it very difficult to accept how they spoke to their solicitor, their own solicitor. And, you know, I was able to say, but carbon monoxide has an effect on how you function emotionally. So it could be that. Um, and they they weren't aware of that and then there was another participant who just couldn't have any positive emotion at all just ha complete anhedonia is the is the um the expression for that and so holidays christmases parties flat reaction death of a parent flat reaction you know just no kind of emotional life at all really um and the other thing i thought was that you know, people recognised it, healthcare professionals, um, you know, and, you know, sort of first responders, fire and rescue services, you know, and I'm sure by and large, you know, sort of that it does happen, but there's people who are missed, you know, um, but I thought that once you were in the healthcare system as somebody who'd been exposed to carbon monoxide, that, you know, you'd be looked after, you'd be treated and supported, and of course that's not the case either, and one of the first people I spoke to um, not in my research, just I went to um, one of the charity events and I just got chatting to somebody who said that um, they'd got in touch with the charity because their alarm had gone off and they'd they left the house and the gas people had come, blah, 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 and they'd gone to the GP and the GP was not in, unsympathetic at all, but just had nothing to help them with, nothing at all. OK, so um, as a summary of my findings, I found that, you know, I, I concluded that it was a traumatic experience for everybody and um, everybody who went through this experienced it very much as a trauma and importantly for what we're discussing next there were lots of um, issues around power relationships power dynamics and the idea of justice and judgment and somebody said to me you know that there's no such thing as justice and that that was a really sort of powerful statement that they made um, and then there was the idea of identity and connectedness. So this is something that's really pertinent to what I'm going to discuss about the underserved community ideas and poverty ideas next. A lot of my, without aiming for this at all, I just wanted a general view of what exposure meant, you know, what effects exposure had had, what was that lived experience. But most of my participants were um, professional people. Uh, you know, they had professional jobs. They knew what I meant. They knew what I wanted when I wanted to talk to them. They they understood the idea of taking part in some research and, you know, learning so, so everybody could learn a bit more about what they've been through. And they wanted that because a lot of them, amazingly, um, spend a lot of time working with charities and they want their story to be told so other people don't go through it. So that's something that's really important for what's coming next. Um, and then the final thing was that everybody seems to be in the dark. And this is everyone from, um, you know, I'm thinking particularly about maybe healthcare personnel, healthcare professionals, um, but nobody seems to be able to give anybody a clear pathway. So this has happened to you and this is what we'll do. And that will that is what will be effective. You know, the, the charities are amazing at supporting people. But there's very little kind of, you know, we'll take this step and then this will happen, you know. Um, and, you know, a lot of my participants by in the same token, they couldn't prove that they'd been exposed to carbon monoxide. You know, they had maybe things like a, a report about their boiler um, sometimes, you know, but nobody had an up to date, you know, on the minute um, carboxyhemoglobin level. You know, it was just very, very difficult. Um, for them. Okay, so I want you to read these, which are paraphrased responses from um, transcripts from, from the earlier research. Um, and I'm going to hush and let you read them, because you can read them quicker than I can say them. So, um, by all means, pop some questions in the chat if you want to hear um, sort of more about those individual things. But on this side, I've kind of tried to sum up what they what they say, what they're saying. So basically this lack of knowledge, you know, it's it's not great for people who aren't feeling well and don't know what the future holds to be told 
we don't know what to do with you. Um, there was also issues of this hierarchy of, of knowledge. So, you know, as a, a person going seeking support, you know, if the person who's in that hierarchy, so clearly kind of there's a level there, the person above you is saying, well, there's no such thing as chronic <laughs> carbon monoxide poisoning, um, then you've got nowhere to go. You know, you, you've got no kind of compensation for that, really. And um, the sick role is a sociological concept, really. And it, it, it's in our society, it means that you can, if you're assigned sick, by a healthcare professional, then you can behave in, in a deviant way. And by deviant, I mean, you can lie on the sofa and drink lots of cups of tea. You know, you can be excused from your normal roles of, you know, work or education or caring or, or whatever it you do because you are sick, but you have to be told you are sick by a healthcare professional. There's very little leeway in you deciding to do these things on your own um, up to a certain point. So that was difficult for people because they didn't have any evidence. And, you know, by and large healthcare professionals, although not all unsympathetic, you know, unsympathetic by any means, just didn't have the means to support them. Um, so they kind of weren't believed um, not that they were accused necessarily of, of lying, but they just weren't believed. You know, you can't be ill because you don't have enough CO in your blood. So this was obviously a long time after the exposure had happened. And as we know, it, you know, sort of those levels dissipate really, really quickly, you know, but this was quite common. If you haven't had ABC, then you can't have been poisoned. Um, so yes, the onus was on the person to provide the proof of poisoning and, you know, there was lots of investigations, this could be something else. A couple of my participants already had chronic health conditions that were very long standing and nothing to do with, with um, carbon monoxide exposure. So that complicated things, you know, because everything they were feeling must be some sort of flare up of this condition you've already got, even though that didn't make sense at all to them. So there you go, some powerful stuff there. Okay. So this led me to um, all of these extra questions, you know, sort of how do you recognize low level um, CO exposure, you know, because it's hard enough recognizing acute, you know, the ones who recognize that there was acute exposure, it tended to be emergency services personnel that identified it as such um, straight away. Um, and then like, how do you stop it? How do you treat it? And how do you raise awareness of this issue? These are questions that us, we as a community have been asking for much, much, far longer than I've been involved. But this is where I'm interested in my work um, in sort of more of the social work and health and social care health arena is about the environment and how does this issue fit within things like the context of poverty and exclusion and that's what we're going to be discussing next and it's important that we do that because people are living with low levels of CO. So one of the projects I'm involved with is the project where there's data loggers that record CO have been placed on um, barges where people live by London Fire and Rescue, and that's where Emma Fraser comes into this. And so I've been looking at the, the data that's that's come out of that, and people are, this is from one of those data loggers that people are over at just this, this period of time here. There's quite significant. So if they've got alarm, an alarm, it'll go off at 50 parts per million. So they haven't done enough to disturb their alarm yet. I've put it into an Excel spreadsheet here because that gives you times. Um, and you can zoom in and see that sort of maybe there's a pattern of early evening. So we're not quite sure what it is. We're not quite sure whether it's um, people running their engines or barbecues or, or or what that could be. But, you know, we do have an issue here that, um, you know, there are people who are living with low levels of, of carbon monoxide and we don't really know why. And we don't know that they know and we don't know that they know enough to protect themselves from 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 that okay so um just going back to that then i wonder if there's anything in the chat um if anybody can um nope nothing in the chat yet right brilliant if you do have something then please please pop it in and we'll continue on so this next section is um, about the underserved communities and poverty and exclusion and social exclusion is is um it just means that you know you can't take part 
you can't take advantage of all the things that your society has to offer if you're excluded for whatever reason sometimes it's straightforward income sometimes it's a little bit more complicated around class and ethnicity and disability and and all those other things and sometimes there's an intersectionality where those things cross so we're going to look at that and who are the underserved communities and just um out of interest this is this is Liverpool this is um, Liverpool was the European city of culture in 2008 and I remember it well I remember what an exciting time it was um, for everyone in Liverpool and I remember that it did bring quite a you know it was great there was a lot of money and investment but it wasn't equal because these things never are so there was there were definitely pockets large pockets of the community that were excluded from the benefits that 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 brought okay so there's a clear link between poverty and poor health. We've known this for a long time. So Townsend, Peter Townsend has written extensively about this and he was one of the authors of the Black Report that came out in 1980 and I referenced that at the end. And the Black Report was the first huge report in this country that, that established that yes, if you're poor, then you're going to have poorer health and you're going to die younger. And that's the only reason, because you're poor. It's not because the NHS is letting you down. It's this complex interaction between things like your income and your education and your diet and your environment and your working conditions and, and all of this sort of thing. Um, but again, it's difficult. Definitions are quite useful at, at these times and it's difficult to define poverty. People don't always agree on what it means. But basically, I tend to stick to the sort of this absolute poverty where you've got nothing and, you know, I can I can fix that by giving you something, you know. So if you've got nothing, then somebody can give you something and you're not necessarily living in absolute poverty anymore, even though that that depends on someone being able to give you something. And then there's relative poverty, which is another common indicator of, of what's going on. And um, that means that you're living below this median um, income that you need to have a, a, a good a standard of living as the people relative to you in your surroundings. Um, and that is a bit more difficult to ameliorate um, because it means that some of the very, very rich people um, maybe need to permanently <laughs> give you some, some of the things that you need in order for you not to be living in that level of poverty anymore. You know, it's a, it's a matter of equity, um, that definition of poverty. And then you get into arguments about deserving and undeserving poor, which seems like very old, but is still very much with us. Um, and you get into ideas of things like people having privilege and things of like internalized shame and poverty of aspiration where people don't bother trying because the finish line is so far away from them that they can't see any point in running the race at all. Um, there's something, if you're interested in this, there's something that sort of sums it up really well for me and it's from 2012, but it's, it's called Lives on the Line and it's where um, some very clever people um, looked at the London underground map and worked out that if you were born near, I think Star Lane was the, the kind of the, the worst in terms of this, you had a life expectancy of 75, but if you were born near Oxford Circus, you could expect to live to 96. And that's nothing you've done, just where you're born, okay? Um, so then we get this idea that sort of the people that are living in poverty can be underserved and that there's this kind of like different categories of this. So this following information is from the National Institute of Health Research. And again, there's a reference at the end if you want to do more reading about that, because um, health research is obviously a, a good way of, of helping people. Um, and so they've come up with this, these concepts of being underserved and they worked with people to come up with the term because people often don't like terms like, you know, hard to help or hard to hear or, you know, sort of uh, those sorts of terms. But underserved you know sort of they are there they just the needs aren't being met in the same way as some of the rest of us needs are being met so it's very context specific so absolutely depends on what you're doing and um, but it can include all of these so if you're very young very old which and you're more likely to be affected by carbon monoxide if you're in very young or very old um pregnancy childbearing age different again carbon monoxide different ethnic minority groups, um, the LGBTQ+, 
military veterans. I've underlined that because we are doing some work with military veterans um, in an ecotherapy centre and um, people who do not attend regular medical appointments in multiple excluded categories. So where these things mix um, and I feel that that's a lot of the population that we're looking at. So socially marginalised people, most definitely, that's the population that we're looking at. Stigmatised populations, definitely. Looked after children, disabilities, and then all of these as well. Lower education and attainment, um, socioeconomically disadvantaged. So we're going to be talking about Irish travellers. So they quite often do have lower educational attainments because they tend to, um, the children tend to leave school around the age of 14. And I'm generalising here, it's not true at all for everybody in that community. But it's because they don't, you know, that that's the age that they feel is quite risky for their children. They don't, you know, they see um, other children as getting involved in things like, you know, promiscuous behaviour or, or drugs or, and they don't want that for their children. They, you know, the family values are very important to them. So that's one reason why um, there's lower educational attainment in that community. And they are socioeconomically disadvantaged, but they're generally not unemployed. They generally do work. Um, but they are in alternative residential circumstances, as much as the military veterans are as well. So migrants, asylum seekers, people in care homes or prison, traveller communities, homeless, um, remote. So I underline these first. I started underlining them because I thought, you know, these all apply to people that I'm, I'm working with. Um, but then I thought it's, it's all of it, isn't it? You know, I gave up underlining after a bit because it's all of it, you know, so... Um, but yes, long list. Um, so in this underserved communities, we need to understand really that the impacts of poverty and exclusion affect all of us, even if we're not living in poverty and even if we don't perceive ourselves as being excluded, it does impact all of us because it impacts society. And we have high levels of inequality in what is, depending on which scale you go by, the fifth, sixth or seventh richest country in the world, the UK, but we do have high inequality. Um, so if we're failing to harness skills, um, you know, then the whole country's economic growth suffers. And we're storing up problems for the future, you know, with child poverty, because um, you have things like, um, interestingly, poverty leads to obesity for lots of reasons. You know, parents work too long hours and don't have the facilities to cook proper food for their children. And, you know, so it's much more convenient kind of food cooking. Um, uh, you know, they might not have the, um, the, the kitchens that are properly equipped, et cetera, et cetera. Um, you know, and in some cases, parents conversely may be skipping their own meals to so that their children aren't hungry. Um, even if they're not particularly well nourished, they're not hungry. Um, so, so that has an impact on parenting. And we know that stress has an impact on your mental health. We know that um, a certain level of income means that you're more likely to have a mental health disorder. Just that on its own is a risk factor, which makes sense when you think about it. Um, so all of these things are important and the impact is all as a community. Um, so that's, you know, and we're, we're at a time where things are quite difficult we've got you know there are children who are going to bed who are hungry and cold and there's other people who are choosing between heating and eating and you know for a country as rich as us then it's you know it's it's um it's really not great is it um and what i thought about carbon monoxide fitting into this so this is quite a, a big study that's not done in this country but it looks at sort of things like particulate matter and things like that and it's found that um people who um live um people who live in areas where there's there's more pollution this is not going to surprise anybody i'm sure are more likely to have health impacts and we know that it's just we know that you're more likely to have heart disease just because you live near a main road which again is is no surprise and this is an older study that was done here and i say older because um this was the study where they found that carbon alarm carbon monoxide alarm ownership was uh, predicted by income, you know, sort of the less income that you had, the less likely it was that you owned a carbon monoxide alarm. And this shouldn't matter anymore, certainly for people in rented accommodation, because um, landlords should be providing alarms for them. But this is an issue for the travelling community, and I'm just going to come on to you next. 
okay. So um, any questions about that, pop them in the chat. I will stop in a minute because there's already one in there. So this is the Irish Traveller site where I am placing data loggers to see if there are any ambient levels of carbon monoxide and where I am also talking to the residents who live there to ask them about their knowledge and any experiences that they had. And it will be asking the standard, you know, sort of who lives here, um, do they have any health concerns, are their children, are they, you know, sort of those questions. So um, I'm just hoping this works. I'm going to go onto Google Earth. So can you let me know if you can see that? Can you see that all right? Yeah, Thinking, we can yes. see it. Can see thank it. you, yeah. thank you, Adrian. So this is this is Liverpool, this is North Liverpool. So to the, the bottom right of the screen is the city centre, um, not too far away. Um, if you go sort of uh, right and up a little bit, that's where I live, so not too far away. And if I just zoom in here, then this is the camp. This here is the camp of that picture that I showed you. This is a ventilation shaft for the tunnel uh, that sort of doesn't really show in the picture, but looms large over the site. And you saw the height of the walls and you can see from here that there's only one way in and there's no way out. This is a very, very busy dual carriageway, a very main arterial route into the city centre. And uh, Google's worked its magic and there's no cars on here, but there, it, there's always cars on here. It's very busy. This is a railway line and this is another very busy road. So there's shops over here um, and houses um, and schools. And there's a Costco down here, but not everybody can go to Costco. But I can't, I can't sort of emphasize enough what a, a border this road and this railway line are to people living here. And it was a lorry park. So there's nothing else around except other lorry parks. Um, and there's there's been recent kind of developments to sort of, um, you know, uh, do some building and development with with here. But but it is not really a place where where people live. Um, so that's that. So I'll just go back to the, the show there. Um, so the people who live here are tenants. They pay rent, they pay council tax, and they are also, because they're Irish travellers, protected under the Equality Act 2010. Um, and they had a very different lockdown experience. So I don't know if like, some of you might remember that. This was all planned, this research, to start before, yeah, just as lockdown hit. Um, and then we kept on sort of saying, you know, can we start it, can we start it again? And they were just, the, the, the people who lived here were just kind of left to it without any support or any help. Um, and what I was saying before in the last slide about people, um, you know, landlords being, you know, they should provide carbon monoxide alarms as well as doing the, the gas safety check. I found out, um, and I made the assumption that it was happening, but I found out that it wasn't happening. So there's a recent report that um, the, there's a bridge building organization, a, a charitable organization that I'm working really closely with in order to work with the community. And they have commissioned this um, health and safety report of the site. And it makes for shocking reading. Somebody, a child got electrocuted, not, you know, sort of severely injured, but electrocuted for reaching for a biscuit tin because there was an exposed cable. There's broken steps. There's, there's you know, there's damp, there's mold, there's no repairs. There's, it's just for, for people who are paying rent and council tax, it's awful. And I, as I say, made the assumption that they would be having gas safety checks and they would have carbon monoxide alarms because that's the law. And their landlord is the local authority. So it's the local authority are the people who fine landlords for not doing these things. And it's just it's just not happening for them at all. So that's their situation. Um, and so they've got an awful lot to contend with at the moment. And it's really hard to convey how difficult their lives are. But in this, we're saying that, you know, that the fact that you might be living with low levels of carbon monoxide or the fact that you need to protect yourself, you need to be, you need to have knowledge about carbon monoxide. It's quite a small priority for, for them at the moment, but they are very interested in, in rejoining and, and you know, restarting this, this study. Okay, so I've got, um, I've got a little thing for you to do now. So if you go to your phones and you um, just type in um, VVOX, that word in a browser, 
this is like an online poll and we're just going to do one little thing to um to sort of just as an exercise just to see so if you do that then it will ask you to enter an id and it's that id number that you want so you don't have to worry about the dashes i'm going to move on the slide now but the, this number is still on the next page as well so and if i press enter there then i can already see that people are joining so well done people um, so what terms have you heard in association with this community, the Irish travelling community? So you can enter as many as you like. And this is completely anonymous. I've got no way of I've got no way of saying who's who wrote who wrote what. And of course, it's what you've heard. You know, it's I'm not asking you for sort of any any sort of personal input here. It's just what terms have you heard in association with this community? So and it will make us um, a, a nice little word cloud. So I'll just let people you can um you can enter as many as you like so anything that you've heard so we've got six out of ten this is the part where i don't know whether people are struggling or <laughs> uh, but you know if, if you can't if you find that you can't join in for whatever reason then by all means just think of the terms and see if they pop up in the word cloud when we've we've done, but I'm going to close that now because we've still got plenty to get through. So I'm sorry if you're <laughs> if you're still trying to to put things in. So yes, gypsy traveller, homeless, nuisance deprived, dipo, insular, insular community. Yes. So yeah, and they are protected, but unfortunately, I don't think the 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 sort of the protection is is great for them really um in terms of you know just as simple as and as the legal obligation to provide them with gas safety checks for appliances and carbon monoxide alarms okay so this next thing is also asking you to do something so um by your mute buttons you should have something that says annotate and it's a green pen and i want you to click on that and to click on where it says stamp because you get um you get um a cross and a tick and I want you to think about using them so what's going to appear are some headlines they might be headlines they might have appeared in papers and I, about the gypsy traveler community and I want you to um tick if you think if it's a true headline and put a cross if you think it's a false headline um but the idea is that sometimes I've heard people say that oh no we do live in an equal society now no and there's no racism anymore so that's what I'm I want to explore and because the other thing we have if we don't have connection with the community if they do seem to be insular to us and sometimes people get their ideas from the media so it's quite an important thing to to look so are we still racist about gypsy and traveling communities so if you can i would very much like some crosses and ticks on there Oh, there's sticks, lovely. So yeah, some people are, yes. I'll actually talk and let you carry on ticking. So this is actually a true one. Matty the Blonde Angel found living in Ireland. And this is from about 10 years ago. And um, a child who had been adopted by a travelling couple was taken away from them on the grounds that she didn't look like them. So they found they said they said all along she's adopted, but it wasn't official. So um, unfortunately, the child ended up growing up in um, a children's home while it was sorted out, um, you know, they never pretended that she was theirs biologically, um, but she lost the only home that she'd known. And I made the mistake of, of looking at a Daily Mail report on, on this before they'd been found innocent of kidnap. Um, and um, yeah, unfortunately, the, the um, it was, it was um, you know, sort of you left other children there, that's disgraceful. They should all have been taken away, you know, and, and DNA and um, so that's the the trope that gypsies steal babies. That's that's a really ancient 
idea that you know that's sort of a moral panic that's you know, um, our children are likely to be stolen by gypsy traveller communities, which is awful, really. Um, and this one, uh, I think, I think Connolly might have been on there. And this is, you know, this it's a very low bar, not being discriminatory, like so openly. But it wasn't people, you know, sort of people who've been to Pontins and have misbehaved or, you know, behaved antisocially or broke the law. Um, so they are banned. It's people who have surnames that maybe we think might behave in a certain way and they were just Irish surnames. So um, I feel about that a bit differently personally than I do about the others. Um, but actually, they're all headlines. They've all been in, in the press, um, in the media, you know, about a community. And um, I read something that said that um, it's, it's the last acceptable form of racism um you know sort of a middle class people are actually slightly more likely to be um prejudiced against or have stereotypical ideas about traveling communities um whereas they wouldn't be you know they wouldn't be racist about other minorities um or other ethnicities but traveling communities is kind of the last acceptable face of that right so i'm going to clear all your lovely drawings that's what it says on there and move on from this so i'm just going to open the chat now because there's um there's lots so there's um something about the website oh right no it's fine oh have there been um Bryn, hi thank you any difficulties with engagement and participation from the traveling community we experienced any lost data loggers not any lost ones but yes definitely difficulties with engagement and participation from the traveling community in terms of um i'll come to it in a little bit a bit more maybe but they don't really understand what it's about um they kind of i've had a after lockdown before lockdown they were very very keen after lockdown it was a little bit more um a little bit more kind of like oh we know <laughs> we've got other things to worry about we know about carbon monoxide so we had to sort of re-engage and you know sort of say this is part of how you know everything that's going on with your health and where you live and and how you're treated by the landlord and things like that and to sort of make that re-engagement with them um but no 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 lost data loggers i know that um i'm receiving the ones from the from the richmond canal boat study and i'm they're coming through very slowly i think we expected a few more to come through than have come through so i don't know whether that will turn out to be to be something there okay um yes yeah, so a trustee and a charity where people have many hidden conditions such as fibro alasthenus pots yes um you don't look unwell yeah exactly exactly that's exactly it um so um yes 15 minutes left sorry Kimberly <laughs> we'll be fine we'll be fine so um Moving on, please keep your questions coming. Thank you for that. Moving on, we're going to talk about lived experience and qualitative research and how does it help our understanding of CO? And I'm sure you've, you've read all that. So that's fine. So this is an interesting, you know, why don't we hear the person's voice? And I've talked about some of this in, in other presentations. So I'll, I'll skim over it. But again, we've got this hierarchy, this idea that there's relationships, that there's people who know more and have more power and there's people who don't and the people who don't even if they're experiencing it that's not as important as the people who do and it goes back to those ideas of the sick role you know if we only ever had tonsillitis we'd be much better off you know and that model would work so people's interpretation can lack recognition even if it's theirs and you, it's difficult to understand other people's experiences especially when there's this social and cultural context um, so they, their testimonies can be irrelevant, confused, too emotional, whatever that means, unhelpful, time consuming, um, people regarded as cognitively unreliable or emotionally compromised, like the veterans, the veterans are quite often suffering from PTSD in one form or another, um, so that means somehow that, you know, they're, may, maybe that's where the too emotional is, you know, um, they're just unstable existentially unstable just not quite to be trusted um to upset to think straight mental health how common are mental health disorders one in four people um older people somehow we've we've lost the connection of wisdom and age um 
So, but you may be ignored, rejected, discounted, maybe relevant, maybe people do want to listen to you, but it's not as important as the authority. It's, you know, what you have to say isn't as important as the authority. And I've used curare, this plant, curare, which was used as a paralytic and anaesthetic. And people thought it made you unconscious back in the 1940s as well as paralyzed, but it doesn't. So people were waking up, but it was mainly used on children. So when they said that they, they weren't unconscious, people didn't believe them until a doctor tried it himself because it was a him and said, oh no, hang on a minute. That's actually, you know, it, it just makes you unable to move. So when you think about this experience, so this is gonna disappear in three minutes. So we won't necessarily have things to add to this, but it's just a way of showing you what it's like to think about experience from like a research point of view. So if I said to you, go for a swim, I just, as a free writing exercise, if you write about what that phrase means to you. So I have set it going so you can write it down, but I do want to sort of go through really. I don't want to sort of take up too much of your time, but free writing is a great exercise. If you ever have to write reports for work and things and you get stuck, just kind of open a page and start writing about how frustrated you are that you can't think of what to write and it really helps. Um, so, and I, I chose that one because it's in the sort of the, the IPA that I'm going to talk about in a minute. It's it's in there about how kind of like it might be sort of if you take an experience, people experience things all the time, but what makes it meaningful is something that's very, very individual. And people can take you back to a time where they can describe what they felt under their feet, you know, what the the, what the, the warmth of the sun or, or the sun wasn't there and you know you can have these experiences and something emotional might happen and that makes it more memorable and that makes it more meaningful for you as a person okay so and we don't often allow ourselves time to think about what something means so I put a very plain picture of water here so that I wasn't trying to sort of um you know sort of uh, sort of put anything in your minds but if I put this picture here then and said tell me about going for a swim you might have come up with something different because you might you know you might hate swimming <laughs> or you, the last time you had a swim might not have been like this at all and or you might be more like me sort of that kind of that kind of uh, swim but the importance of an experience and the importance of looking experience means that you can hopefully connect with that other person and really appreciate what it is they've got to say because all of the medical texts don't tell us what that experience is like. So they don't let us help people in a way that they, they really need to be helped. So I did interpretive phenomenological analysis, which I will refer to as IPA from now on. And it's this kind of three or maybe four key points of that. And it's, it's about taking you back to the experience itself. You know, the thing that mattered to the person. And you can't do that. If you were telling me something that happened and it was really important to you and it really changed everything, there was a clear before and after, then you can't take me back. You've only got language to talk to me to tell me how it happened and what it meant. And then I interpret that. And I interpret that in a way that's personal to me as well, because if we're talking about swimming, for instance, you know, maybe maybe like I'm scared of water, maybe like I don't like swimming, you know, all of those things. So I'm thinking those things while you're talking about going for a swim. And we might actually have very different interpretations of the same experience. So as a researcher, I've got to find a way to connect with yours, you know, which is why it takes so long. So we concentrate on the person rather than the general. So we're concentrating on this person's experience of um, being exposed to carbon monoxide for instance, and as a nurse, I was, uh, it took me a while to realize I was doing this, but if they mentioned physical symptoms, I'd sort of go, oh, did that really, help? you know, that kind of, uh, you know, that would sort of excite me, if you like, a bit more than them, than telling me about what happened with the, with the gas engineer. And I realized that was wrong and I shouldn't be doing that. It was, you know, because I was there for the exposure experience, not for a particular aspect of it. Okay, so that's what ideographic is. That's just that, that kind of like sort of emphasis on the person. And the reflexivity is where I recognize where I am in that. So that idea of, you know, me having a health care background didn't mean anything, you know, I was there to, um, to help them with that. Okay, so this is a little roadmap in experience. And again, it's from the um, National Institute of Health Research. 
um, suggesting intervention at points in order to help improve inclusion in the research. So we're really lucky with the Irish Traveller Study because we've got um, the, the, the organisation to talk us through. But this is a really good, you know, there's checkpoints in these processes. So everything I'm doing is being designed with so that's my kind of moral justification for working as it's been this way is that I should be doing things with the community, not to the community or in the research on the community. It's like I do it with the community. So so I've got a broad stroke outline here, but um, the final study design isn't quite, you know, we've worked out a, a, a you know, a, a very heavily penciled in. Or, um, structure with with the with the ICC the community the um, charitable organisation, but we are going to leave it up to the the um, the community the travellers themselves to tell us exactly what they want, and then again we're going to sort of like change that round you know when we get there and um, before we do and we very much want to work with them when it comes to the dissemination and engagement the impact of it as well so that's quite a useful. Um, thing there and then sort of uh, towards the final thing I just wanted to talk about the health belief model and how maybe it could help um, and this other model here so you're likely to act to protect yourself if you know that you're susceptible and you know that it's severe and then there's all these modifying factors that come into it and cues to action might be that you have a symptom or you know somebody who's been affected and um, but there's all these benefits and barriers and it comes down to you know if I've got a Mars bar and an apple you know which one's good for you don't you you know that it's that kind of thing but for carbon monoxide you know sometimes we're kind of thinking that maybe people are unaware of the issue and I think a lot of the traveler community is certainly either unaware or, or unengaged because they've got so many other things going on in their lives but this this might help me to um to decide the next steps to take because I can tailor my approach according to where people are in this model, yeah. Um, and then I'm going to talk about, just finally, there's the Irish Traveller study now. So hopefully this is a study at the Liverpool site. This is a pilot study and we're going to, we've already sort of made some inroads into making connections with people who can take this to a, a more national, you know, gypsy and traveller, um, sort of people who live on the road. And there's more and more people who are doing things like that, who are living kind of off the grid, um, so we want to make sure that they know how to protect themselves against carbon monoxide exposure. Um, and we're doing the military veteran study as well. We're placing data loggers to get ambient readings and exploring ways of sharing that knowledge too in that community. And then there's people living on the canal boats. And then I've, um, I've got a contact, I've made a contact with um, somebody who's a showman and they're the people who, um, they live and work with traveling fairs. And they're very interested that there's an awful lot of generators in, in their lives. And then we've got so many groups, poverty, hardship. And so there's um, a contact, um, it's contact being made with um, the sort of, the, it's in criminology, really not in John Moore's, but it's social justice. So they're interested in how net zero impacts um, people such as the people who live in the Irish travel community or the military veteran community, um, you know, and how that sort of the, inequality things there so there's some references for you and there's a summary I feel like I've thrown loads of loads of uh facts at me there um so yeah so there's many complex reasons reasons why individuals and communities live in poverty and why they may be underserved but we know there's a link between poverty and poor health and we do think you know we know exposure is under recognized generally and we do know that it impacts underserved groups. And we know that lived experience research with people helps us to learn about those cultural barriers, um, you know, often not often given space to manage and are not empowered and whose health is affected. So thank you very much indeed. That is the end of my talk. And I'm sorry, I've gone over, I do apologize. <laughs> but that's it. So what we've got in the chat is, Hi, Adrian. <laughs> Hello. I think we've just one question left in here. It's from Michaela. Um, does gender make a difference in being heard? Uh, women less than men. For example, 53% of women have a misdiagnosis when they have a heart attack. Um, yes. Um, no, I didn't address it already, Michaela. Um, I'd say absolutely. I'd say every sort of intersectionality especially depending on the context 
means that you've got less likelihood of being heard. But that is a really good example of the, the misdiagnosis thing, you know, because the, the traditional, you look for this, this and this when you're having a heart attack and they were kind of more male symptoms than they were female symptoms. Um, because women tend not to have cushion central chest pain, et cetera, et cetera. And again, I'm speaking in, in very general terms. And I think that's true for carbon monoxide exposure. You know, I didn't really speak to anybody who had headache, nausea, vomiting, dizziness, unconscious. You know, there was no kind of linear progression like we see. And that's that's a problem generally in health promotion and awareness about health is that we give these broad messages and we scatter them out and we hope that they land so an awful lot of people go oh that's not me that's that doesn't apply to me so I won't take that action or I won't you know look after myself like that does that make sense is that helpful thanks thanks Julie well uh, one more question before we wrap up now um it's from John O'Grady who is chair of our communications um committee and, and then one of our trustees are you able to come to any conclusions about the causal factors of low-level CO in the groups that you've studied? I think it's, oh, <laughs> um, I can I can come to them. I don't know if I'm right. Um, I can come to them. Um, causal factors would definitely include things like, you know, sort of a mixture of, there's too many other things to worry about. You know, I haven't got any, any cash to get my appliances properly serviced. And um, they're old, they're kind of unreliable, but I'm not well, so I need to keep warm, you know, so I can't risk not having it on. Um, and oh, there's so many. There's I think there's so many. I think I think, you know, I think there's a huge kind of um a huge disparity. Yeah, so while carbon monoxide can affect everybody, I do think that idea about being able to talk about it as a as a maybe middle class professional articulate person is really different than it is if you're not in that situation and you're you're not in a position where you understand someone like me coming to talk to you about research you know and you're giving me your time and you don't see it as you're just giving me your time and I'm not paying you you know you see it as as, as something worthwhile to do and so I think I think at the moment we're kind of unknown really um so I'm gonna that sounds very like I'm a politician doesn't it John I'm sorry I'm not being more direct than than that um but yeah definitely I do think it's just sort of the conditions the environment that people are in really that that means you know that, that there's a possibility that there's more low level CO there Thanks, Judy. I think that's a really, really good point to bring in what I sort of call the parish notices, the bits that I'd, I'd like to say at the end. Um, I think, first of all, thanks thanks for coming and, and, and giving this presentation. Uh, we met last week and you know that, you know, I, I, I take this particular area of research really seriously. And, and I think that, you know, sometimes we do overlook and forget, even as people working in this area, we, we forget that people have been affected and that's something that we should do more on. Um, yes. I think that it's really, really important that we look at those areas of social exclusion and we recognise that, you know, the risk there is sort of multifactorial and it's a complete set of environmental issues that affect these underserved communities. Um, when you first put your slides up, there are four bullet points from your research, of the four kind of make key takeaways. And I thought that the, the, the issues around sort of power, justice and judgment, identity and connectedness were really, really, really key because mm -hmm. it's not just, those things that we often think about, you know, low incomes or particular, you know, yes. demographic yes. things. It's also about being able to interact, being heard, that, yes. that power dynamic on both sides, feeling yes. able to talk to someone or feeling talked down to or being not being recognised. So I think, you know, there's, the, like you said, in response to John's question, there's so many factors here. Um, what we've agreed is that off the back of this lecture um, in the summer, probably the first week of July next year, we're going to hold a one day workshop, or probably called Making Sense of Carbon Monoxide Exposure to pick up and try and tease out some of those threads, um, to look at some of the behavioral issues, look at some of the power issues, look at some of those different dynamics, some different demographic you know, factors that, that feed into this. Um, I don't think we'll do it all in a day, but I think we're sort of putting a flag in the sand and saying, this is something that we want to look at. Um, so. I hope that if anybody is interested in being a part of that, being a part of the conversation in terms of contributing or just coming along and listening, 
if they want to reach out to either Julia or I. Um, we're in the planning stage at the moment, so we're open to ideas. Um, I think Lisa put in the Q&A, we'll be sharing research. Um, Julia's research is available on our website, and I'm yeah. sure you know anything else, perhaps we could share the slides when we send out the note. Okay. Yes. Um, I can do that, yes. Thank you, thank you. Um, so next month is December. Um, it's traditionally not a great month for us to do the lecture, so we're going to skip um, December. We'll be back on the 16th of January, where we're going to be welcoming Rebecca Close from the UK Health Security Agency. We'll be coming to talk about uh, epidemiological work, I hope. Um, and then just another date for your diary on the 18th and 19th of June next year. We'll be holding our two-day conference up in, up, 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 depending on where you are in the country, up for me, up in Edgebaston in Birmingham. Um, and this year's themes will be around technology and um, data. They were kind of the things that were our takeaways from last year's conference. And there's a number of different projects and issues, things that are going on now that hopefully we'll be able to bring to that meeting there. Um, Judy, before we wrap up, is there anything else you wanted to uh, add before I say thank you? <laughs> no, I don't think so. Thank you so much for for your time. It's this is something that is like really, really important to me. Um, you know, and I'm delighted that other people are interested in it as well. So thank you so much for for your time, Adrian, and for everybody who's come and, and contributed oh, and listened. Well, thank you. Okay, well, have a lovely afternoon, everybody. Thanks for joining the meeting today. A copy of the presentation will be circulated as will. Um, a recording of the presentation. So thanks, Judy. Thanks, everyone else. And have a great afternoon. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.